In 2009, a man in L'Aquila, Italy, saw flickering lights dancing above the stone street. He immediately knew what to do and moved his family to a safer place. Only seconds later, a massive 8.3 magnitude earthquake hit the whole region. His knowledge of the strange lights saved his and his family's lives. So what are those mysterious warnings? For centuries, people interpreted the lights as something otherworldly. The scientific community didn't take them seriously, just put them down to a false recollection, a mind trick, or pure imagination. With the introduction of surveillance cameras and smartphones, the amount of evidence grew enormously. Now the connection was obvious. Lights appear and an earthquake hits. So, experts finally started taking it seriously and started digging for the truth. But after years of research, to this day, geologists are still not fully sure what the source of the lights is. But they have recognized five types of them. Bright flashes that light up the sky, looking like storm lightning or a strong camera flash. Rays in the sky that can look like light columns. Different sized flames that come through the ground. Diffused glows over the mountains. And slow moving balls of light that can be misinterpreted as ball lightning. Another equally little understood atmospheric phenomenon. These are literal balls of lightning that can float and explode, leaving a sulfuric odor behind. But unlike ball lightning, these spherical EQLs seem to be harmless, if you don't count what's coming afterward. But with all these types of lights, experts can't know how exactly they're connected to earthquakes. They don't only show up before one hits. Some have been reported during and after earthquakes. They can also appear with other phenomena, like meteorite crashes, volcanic eruptions, or auroras. For now, scientists can only come up with theories to explain the unexplainable. One of the recent ones claimed the lights were electric lines being broken during an earthquake. But this theory doesn't explain how the phenomenon was observed hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Like the ancient Chinese tale of dragon-looking clouds appearing in the sky as a warning of an upcoming quake. Or how an ancient Roman historian reported huge flame-like lights bursting out just before a huge earthquake occurred. The electric line theory was quickly dismissed. Another theory suggested it was escaping gas. During an earthquake, the underground rocks expand and shrink under pressure and heat. This opens and closes small spaces between them. Different gases make their way through these new openings. Radon, for example, can get released during seismic activity. It can ionize the air, making it electrically charged. But radon doesn't do it enough to create bright sparks of light. This theory is close, but doesn't quite hit the mark. One of the most accepted theories is that it might be from electricity traveling up from underground. When underground igneous rocks, ones that form from magma deep within the Earth, are under stress, they release ionized, or electrically charged, oxygen. It travels through the surface and up into the atmosphere, where it creates a localized electric field. That can produce brief flashes of visible light. Some aren't even that quick and can go on for minutes at a time. So there you are. You've been driving for hours through the night. You didn't have any chance to sleep, so your mind is hanging by a thread. You stop the car and go out to stretch your limbs. And then you look up into the sky and see a beautiful sunrise. Whoa, wait, there are three suns in the sky. You rub your eyes, but nope, there are still three bright stars in the sky. No, our home star hasn't been torn into three pieces, nor has it been visited by two other stars. This is called a sun dog. It occurs mostly during severe frosts. Small ice crystals in the sky bend the light. As a result, you may see three bright spots in the sky instead of just one. This phenomenon is officially called a halo. Usually, it's just a circle around the sun. You can even see a halo at night, too. Just look at a street lamp, and you'll see a bright circle around it. Sometimes, a halo can take on a fancier shape. If there's a lot of ice in the air, the light is warped even more. Just like in a room with a dozen mirrors. Then, the halo can take on the shape of a human eye. 
Because of this phenomenon, a false dawn can occur too. While you're looking at the horizon, the dawn begins, and the edge of the sun appears. A little bit more, and wait, the sun starts to just dissolve in the sky. After a few moments, it's dark again. And only a minute later, the real sun shows its face. It was the same light curvature effect you saw before with the three suns. Only now, the light is curved vertically, not horizontally. And instead of the real sun, its reflection in ice crystals in the sky appeared. And now moving on. This cloud looks like a dinosaur. And this one looks like a cat. And this, whoa, it looks like these clouds are falling down. Oh, phew, that's just a mammatus cloud. Their shape really makes them look like chunks of cloud about to slam on the ground. Well, that's not going to happen, but you better start seeking cover anyway. Such clouds are a sign of a severe thunderstorm coming. It takes a lot of moist air with ice crystals at the top and dry air at the bottom to create such clouds. Then, vertical currents of air appear between these layers. And these currents make the clouds take the shape of a human brain. <laughs> And this giant cloud looks like a dome that's going to cover an entire city. In fact, that's exactly what happens. A huge cloud covers a large area and then rains heavily on it. Sometimes, the front of such a cloud takes a bizarre shape, like in these pictures. It looks more like several giant spaghetti clouds, or even giant cloud worms. This phenomenon can often be seen in Australia, and it's called morning glory. It happens because a strong wind twists part of the cloud on both sides. And then, the huge sheet of air dough splits into thick strips. And sometimes, you can see clouds in the sky made of birds. Wow, that cloud moves quickly and changes shape. It becomes more transparent, but then denser and darker again. The birds seem to be involved in some kind of dance or performance. But they're not doing it for beauty or for the crowds of spectators gathered below. They're doing it for protection. When birds group themselves into such a cloud, they intimidate birds of prey. An eagle or hawk would have a hard time picking out a single target among the endless number of birds. And they move quickly, covering each other. Fish are huddled together in schools in the same way. Such a cloud might just spook a hungry predator. Grab some sunglasses and you're good to go. This phenomenon lasts around 40 minutes. These clouds are the same ones that can cause a spooky ring around the moon at night sometimes. Nature sends early signs of disasters in many different ways. J-shaped trees might mean there's a landslide coming. Since the ground is moving slowly, the trees grow into this super selfieable shape. Try to find a flat area and avoid going near any trees unless you have superhuman strength. Another mystical phenomenon can be seen in the desert, a sand waterfall. When the wind brings a lot of sand to the edge of the canyon, it begins to fall down. Now amplify this effect 100 times and you get a sand waterfall in Saudi Arabia. It's really like Niagara Falls, only there's not a drop of water. The locals say this phenomenon warns of an impending sandstorm. Ships and planes disappearing without a trace. Passengers never seen or heard from again. Reports of strange lights in the sky. No, these aren't scenes from an upcoming Hollywood blockbuster, but some of the strange occurrences reported for over a century in an area ominously dubbed the Graveyard of Lake Ontario, also referred to as Canada's Bermuda Triangle or the Marysburg Vortex. It stretches across a portion of Lake Ontario from Kingston to Prince Edward County in Canada and down to Oswego, New York in the US. The tales about this area can be as chilling as the frigid lake water on which they took place. The most unsettling story involves the schooner called the Bavaria. It was 1889 and the ship was being towed across the lake. Rough water severed the tow rope and the Bavaria floated away. Luckily, the schooner was later found safe and fully intact. But there was one thing missing, the crew. Not a single person was found on board. What makes the story even more bizarre is that the dinner table was set. A loaf of bread was discovered, freshly baked, 
And the captain's money and his papers were fully accounted for. There was even a pet canary happily chirping away, as if nothing was amiss. What happened to the crew? We may never know. And this was not a unique incident. Just over a decade later, in 1900, three ships, the Annie Minnis, the Picton, and the Acacia, were sailing across the lake. But only two would make it to their final destination. The third one, the Picton, was speeding ahead of the others when it simply vanished. According to a cook on the Annie Minnis, we were well out into the lake and making good time when all of a sudden we saw the Picton's topsails coming off, and then her lower sails settled, and then, while we stood and watched, the Picton just disappeared. It's possible that the ship sank, as there was some wreckage later seen in the water, but the ship itself was never found, and none of its crew ever located. A few weeks later, a bottle with a note inside was discovered in Sackett's Harbor, New York. The note was from Captain Sidley of the Picton. Have lashed Vessie to me with heaving line, so that we will be found together. Vessie was the captain's 12-year-old son. The note creates more questions than answers. If the witnesses were correct, the ship's disappearance was quite quick. When did Captain Sidley know he was in danger? Why not signal for help if he had any warning? And when did he have time to write a note, bottle it, and tie himself to his son? It truly is a mystery. And it was not just ships that ran afoul of the strange forces in the area. Planes also struggled to make it through in one piece. In 1975, Ron Scott flew out from the Picton Airport in his Cessna 172. As he entered the Marysburg Vortex, his plane banked to the side. For several seconds, he was unable to right the plane but once he did, the same force banked him to the other side. Again, he was stuck there for a few seconds, unable to control his plane. A skilled pilot, he had never experienced anything like it before. He was certainly luckier than Royal Canadian Air Force pilot Barry Allen Newman. Newman was at the same spot back in 1952, when he lost control of his jet and crashed into the lake. To this day, his body has not been found. In total, over 270 ships and at least 40 planes have met a tragic end in this area. And adding to the mystery, sometimes people report a series of bright lights or orbs, or a dark ship hovering in the sky. These are even harder to explain. Witnesses willing to report them are adamant they are true. Sid Wells said he watched a strange shape like a multifaceted diamond slowly spinning in the sky, and then it just disappeared. Others claim to have seen it, too. Of course, the Marysburg Vortex is just one of several places around the world known as vile vortices, a term coined by biologist and writer Ivan T. Sanderson. He discovered 12 other equally spaced areas on the surface of Earth where funny things happen. The best known of these, of course, is the dreaded Bermuda Triangle. Situated in the Atlantic Ocean between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico, it has been blamed for the disappearance of thousands of people. They went in, on boats or in planes, but they never came out. Even the explorer Christopher Columbus experienced the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle during his first voyage to America in 1492. He said the compasses pointed in the wrong direction, the sea levels seemed to change dramatically, and he even spotted strange lights in the sky. In 1918, the USS Cyclops which was one of the U.S. Navy's biggest fuel ships, disappeared there. Since the 309 crew members were declared lost at sea when the Cyclops vanished, it's seen as the largest loss of life in the history of the U.S. Navy in a single incident. At the time, the weather was good. The one message sent that day from the ship indicated no issues or concerns, and a distress signal was never sent. A thorough naval investigation followed. Its conclusion? Many theories have been advanced, but none that satisfactorily accounts for the ship's disappearance. In other words, the investigators were stumped. There's also the Dragon's Triangle, located in the Pacific Ocean. The most disturbing story involves a group of Japanese vessels that disappeared in the 1950s. When researchers were sent to investigate what happened, they too disappeared. In each case, it's impossible to truly know what occurred. And it's easy to get caught up in stories of giant sea monsters lurking beneath the waves. Who doesn't like a good scare? And Sanderson was willing to accept the possibility of such stories being true. 
He believed the vile vortices that he studied could be explained by anything from a wrinkle in the space-time continuum to magnetic abnormalities to underwater people. Of course, Sanderson was not only a huge fan of strange places, he also wrote about strange creatures like Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster. His skills as an impartial scientist are questionable, though. In 1948, he claimed that some three-toed footprints found at Clearwater Beach in Florida were proof of 15-foot-tall penguins, arguing that they were impossible to fake. In 1988, Tony Cingerini revealed that he and his friend, attaching some cast-iron feet to his high-top sneakers, were behind the giant penguin hoax. So maybe Sanderson isn't the most reliable source after all. But there are also some very compelling and wholly natural explanations. Let's look specifically at the Marysburg Vortex. It's entirely possible that ships like the Bavaria and the Picton were done in by a mix of bad luck and bad weather. Unsettled weather is certainly not uncommon on Lake Ontario, and flash storms on the open water can prove dangerous to the most skilled sailor. And even today, with advances in weather forecasting, we get it wrong all the time. Back then, there was no way to predict that a storm was just around the corner. And the weather was just one issue. Historian Mark Seguin said that the area was always known to be dangerous, as the lake bed quickly becomes shallow along the eastern shore. There are also small rocky islands and shoals scattered throughout the area, making sailing a risky venture, especially for larger vessels or those weighed down by heavy cargo. By the mid-20th century, modern weather forecasting and improved shipbuilding alleviated most of the hazards of the Great Lakes shipping, resulting in fewer losses. The last major shipwreck in any of the Great Lakes was that of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, which sank off the coast of Lake Superior in 1975, with 29 crew members going down with it. It seems the vortex is no match for human progress. And as for lights or images in the sky? In most cases, it's the result of an interesting phenomenon called thermal or temperature inversion. When this happens, a layer of warm air becomes trapped under cold air. This can result in mirages or reflections. So, a light on the ground that is miles away can be reflected in the sky, giving the impression of a flying object. Other parts of the mystery may be solved with a little time. Lake Ontario's freshwater and frigid temperatures help preserve the ships and planes that came to rest there. As divers and researchers continue to explore the area, maybe we'll finally learn the fate of the Bavaria, the Picton, Captain Sidley, and his son. Bright, colorful flashes of pink and green light up the sky. You're watching it from your backyard in Pennsylvania. That's not something you're used to, but it's very likely to happen more often in the near future as the northern lights are shifting south. Northern lights, or auroras, appear as a result of solar storms. The sun is a huge ball of molten gases that are constantly moving, so such storms aren't rare. Our star produces a huge amount of energy that goes our way. It travels as electrical charges at the speed of about 3 million miles per hour, no big deal. When all those tiny particles from the sun reach Earth's atmosphere, they give some of the energy to atoms and molecules in its upper layer. The atoms and molecules can't hold it and give it off as light. You can see it as spectacular auroras around the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. If you were watching them from space, they'd look like large ovals. The brightness, colors, and shapes auroras take depend on the altitude where the lights are formed and what particles take part in the process. In the northern hemisphere, locations like Alaska, Canada, and much of Scandinavia normally get to see the brightest lights. The biggest solar storm ever was recorded in 1859, and it was so powerful that the northern lights were spotted in Cuba and Honolulu, and southern lights were seen as far up as Santiago, Chile. In latitudes like that of New York, people were able to read newspapers in the dark under those northern lights alone. If something similar happened today, it would have caused one to two trillion dollars in damage. With solar activity and pressure from the solar winds increasing, the Aurora Belt's borders are currently shifting south. Solar activity goes in cycles, each of them 11 years long. We're now in solar cycle 25, which started in December 2019, and will reach its maximum strength between November 2024 and March 2026. So, geomagnetic storms will become stronger and probably even reach G5 levels. 
Those levels are their strength ratings. For you to see the Northern Lights south of the Great Lakes, a storm must be rated at least G3. G5 storms will be able to produce auroras that will even reach Florida. In case you don't want to wait for the sun activity to peak in 2025, head north if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, or south if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. Auroras down there are known as the Southern Lights, or Aurora Australis. It doesn't have to be cold for you to see the Northern Lights, it just has to be dark. Auroras are active throughout the year. You can't see them from April to August in the northernmost parts of the world because it's light 24-7. It's also important that there isn't any precipitation or clouds in the sky. Those will block your view. Light pollution won't help either, so move away from any cities. Try to get to an elevation to maximize your chances of spotting the lights. They can appear in a whole variety of colors, including white-gray. The green-yellow part you're most likely to imagine while thinking of the lights is just the easiest to spot with an unaided human eye. Sometimes you might not see the lights at all, but your camera will still catch them. They might seem dangerously close to Earth, but the closest the northern lights ever get to us is 50 miles. For comparison, planes normally fly at around 6 miles above the surface, and that already seems like a lot. The distance from Earth defines the color of the auroras. When atoms giving us this spectacular show collide closer to Earth, you can see blues and violets in the sky. Green and red auroras are born further away from our planet. Earth isn't the only planet to have northern lights. Jupiter and Saturn both have strong magnetic fields, and scientists spotted auroras up there using the Hubble Space Telescope and the Cassini and Galileo spacecraft. It looks like Saturn's auroras are also caused by solar winds, but it's not so clear about Jupiter. Despite what you can often see online, the northern lights aren't going to disappear altogether. Once the sun passes its activity peak and becomes less active, both the northern and the southern lights will happen less frequently, but will still be gorgeous. Another beautiful rare phenomenon is called the green flash. It happens shortly after sunset or before sunrise when the sun is almost entirely below the horizon, and the Earth's atmosphere bends and scatters light from it. People mostly spot it over the ocean. It can also be yellow, blue, or purple. About once a year, you can spot a rare fire nado in the U.S. Fire tornadoes start when a strong wind picks up heat from a fire. They are made of a flame or ash. They're different from regular tornadoes because they don't start from cyclones. Fire nados are about as tall as the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Unlike fire nados, fire rainbows or rainbow clouds don't cause any damage at all as they don't have anything to do with fire. You can only see them when the sun is very high in the sky and its light is passing through ice clouds, so they're pretty rare. The rainbow halos are just as unique. Again, it takes a specific type of ice crystals in the clouds of the surface of the Earth to bend light from the sun into a perfect ring. The same thing can happen with moonlight. The only difference will be that the moon halos are usually white and sun halos can be rainbow colored. A white rainbow is another rare illusion, this time created by fog and water. Like a usual rainbow, it's formed when light is shining through droplets of water. It loses color because fog droplets are hundreds of times smaller than those of rain. A white rainbow is sometimes mistaken for a moon bow. You can spot this one at nighttime as the moon illuminates it. That's why it's not so bright. If you ever see an upside down rainbow in the sky, that's a circumzenithal arc. It's not really a rainbow, but a kind of halo like those around the sun or the moon. This optical phenomenon is caused by ice crystals in the upper atmosphere. You have the best chance to see a circumzenithal arc when the sun is rather low in the sky. It happens super rarely, but it can rain without a single cloud in the sky. It's sometimes called a sun shower because it looks like the rain is falling straight from the sun. In reality, rain clouds are at a distance from that specific location. With sun rays being angled, the clouds become out of sight. Then, it takes just a little wind to blow the rain in your direction. If you ever travel to regions with high altitudes, you might see something called penitentes. Those ice spikes form only in a really cold and elevated environment where the air is dry. The sunlight turns ice directly into vapor instead of melting it into water. 
That's why these blades of snow and ice up to 15 feet tall start to pop up on the surface of the Earth. One of the rarest types of clouds is lenticular clouds that look like giant mountain hats. They're formed when moist air travels over a mountain or a mountain range and gets into an area of turbulence. Volcanoes can produce bolts of lightning. They're formed in columns of volcanic ash through friction and static electricity to connect the positively and negatively charged particles. To understand how it works, you can rub a balloon across your hair or your feet across a carpet and then touch a metal doorknob. Once a year, just for a few moments, a waterfall in Yosemite turns into a fireball. In winter and early spring, two streams flow down El Capitan Mountain in perfect conditions in February when the sun is hiding behind the horizon. It gets into the right position to reflect off the wall and color the water into fiery orange.